All right, hi everyone, we are live. Welcome to Market Matters. My name is Katie Kuntz and I'm a social media editor here at CNBC. I'm joined by our senior markets correspondent, Bob Pisani, and today we're gonna to be talking all about the latest stock market moves. Nice to see you, Bob. Hello, Katie, how are you? I'm doing well. So a lot to talk about with the market. Um, so let's jump right into it. First up, the market is doing well this week, Bob. So what's moving it? Yeah, it actually is. We're up about one and a half percent. We're about to break out. In fact, we are breaking out to a new high for the year. We're in the highest levels since about, uh, October of last year. So it's certainly nice to see that narrow trading range around 4,100. Um, I think there's a couple of things that are moving the market. Uh, the most important thing that I see is bond yields have been going up this week while the market's been going up. And that's a good sign uh, because when bond yields go down and the market goes up, they the bond people think lower bond yields means a slower economy generally. So there's been some optimism on the debt deal um, recently, but I think there is some hope here that perhaps um, any downturn is going to be somewhat modest. So I think the, this rise in interest rates is probably signaling reduced odds of a recession uh, and maybe some optimism again on, on the debt deal. So again, the S&P is broken out of the range here. So um, I, I think that's really an important thing that's that's been happening right now. So, Bob, um, you know, how is earnings season going so far? We got some reports from retailers this week. What did we learn? Yeah, it's been a very interesting week on the earnings front. Um, Home Depot, for example, had what we call pull forward. So remember during the pandemic, everybody went out and bought lawn chairs, home, did home improvement, uh, fixed up their kitchen. Uh, and that pulled forward a lot of the demand. So a lot of that's already done. So they reported some slower growth in the discretionary area. That's kind of not surprising. Uh, also, some people, you know, inflation is higher, maybe less money for people to spend. So they cut back on discretionary items. Other than that, though, it hasn't been bad this week. Target also mentioned discretionary items like lawn chairs were a little weaker, weaker but staples were strong. Uh, and the consumer, they made a point of saying, is still in very good shape. Walmart did fine. They're, they have a nice mix of groceries and consumer staple stuff, so along with a lot of the discretionary stuff. So they're fine. Um, the job market is still relatively strong. I, so I would say so far, the retail reports have been fine. Overall, earnings are holding up better than people thought. So remember going into the first quarter. Remember last year, at the end of last year, everybody thought, well, we're going to have a terrible year. Earnings are going to come down because there's going to be a recession. So people were thinking that earnings were going to be 10, 20 percent lower. Um, and it hasn't happened. People started lowering their estimates for the first quarter and they've been wrong. The estimates actually have been coming up for the first quarter because the numbers have come in better than expected. Second quarter is a little bit lower, but not dramatically. The second half of the year, the estimates really haven't changed at all. That whole, that goes to this overall phase. Partly the soft landing, partly in strength in growth stocks like technology stocks. The bottom line is this. Everyone was, the pessimists were thinking earnings are going to be down 10 to 20% this year. Right now, the current estimates are earnings to be up about 1%. That's not a big year, but that's not down 10 to 20%. So the pessimists have been expecting and calling upon this recession for six to eight months now. And it hasn't happened yet. Now, we may get one. We may get a mild downturn or not mild downturn. But we've certainly anticipated this recession for an awfully um, long long time. And so far, it hasn't happened. So, Bob, something that um, we've been watching a lot recently is the debt ceiling negotiations. Um, some news, actually, just as we were kind of coming online today, is that today's talks have been halted. Um, so. What do all of these negotiations mean for the market? Yeah, I mean, generally, there was a lot of optimism about this. Um, and um, the, we, we saw some uh, headlines just about oh, half an hour or so ago that um, the Republicans have walked out of negotiations. So, and the market actually moved on that. Uh, Powell was speaking at the same time, but it looks like the market moved on that. And Yellen also made some comments about there may be some consolidation of regional banks. So. Um, I don't think we have exactly finished uh, these negotiations. They haven't wrapped up, obviously, yet. Um, so what I think is going on here in the longer term, not the short term, 
is these are the opening salvos in a more serious discussion about entitlements that's occurring. And the Republicans have brought this up and they're right to bring it up. Um, the government budget last year, I think it was six trillion dollars. That's the government budget. About 50 percent of that was Social Security, uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Fifty percent of all money goes to those entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Now, those are hugely popular programs, um, but we've got to figure out a better way to pay for them. Um, Social Security alone was almost a quarter of the budget. Um, just to give you a sense of the rest of it, defense was 13 percent. Paying the debt was I don't know, five to seven percent. So everything else, all the what we call these discretionary items, were sort of pretty small part of the overall business, um, you know, maybe 20 percent. So it's the entitlements where they have to have a discussion. Nobody's going to make a deal on that right now, but we can talk about Social Security some other time. But you're going to have to raise the taxes on Social Security or you're going to have to cut the benefits uh, or you're going to have to extend the retirement age somehow. You don't have to do this this year, but, uh, you know, the, there's going to be some serious discussions on entitlements down the road. And um, I think they're going to be very acrimonious. Nobody wants their Social Security to get cut. Nobody wants to be forced to work longer. They already did this a few years ago. There's been a huge fight in France. They tried raising it from 62 to 63 and 64. And there's, there's been protests around the country there. Uh, here, your basic retirement age is about 66. You can retire at 62, but your Social Security benefits, uh, um, you know, kick in around 66 and full benefits only until 70. So people are already, you know, waiting a while to retire. So I think there's going to be a little bit of a food fight about this in the, in the next few years. Yeah, definitely something we'll be watching closely. Um, so Bob, our next question, um, how can I make money in the stock market? What do you think? Well, first off, the thing you need to do is talk to a professional. And the way I say, the professionals will ask you about what's your risk tolerance? Um, you know, how old are you? And the reason that they ask you that is because that'll determine how much you can have in stocks versus bonds versus real estate. Um, bonds return very steady, steady rates of return, but not much. It's gotten better recently, which is why some people put money into bonds. But compared to the stock market, long term, bonds underperform. Uh, there may be short term periods where bonds do better, but the stock market returns about 10 percent a year on average. This is going back decades. That doesn't come. The bond market doesn't come close to that. So you're going to have to take a little more risk. The stock market's riskier. Um, you know, you can talk to professionals. I tell people in my book, shut up and keep talking about what I did. Uh, and, I, you know, I had almost 75% of my 401k in, in stocks and mostly index funds. Uh, S&P 500 is my largest holding. I own a small cap fund, index fund too. Um, and the what, what you do here is you put money away on a regular basis and you don't try to time the market. You don't say, I'm going to pull money out because I think the money's going to drop and then market's going to drop, and then I'm going to put it back in. Market timing does not work. The evidence is overwhelming on this. You do not know when the market's going to outperform or underperform. Nobody knows, in fact. You have no particular inside information on anything, and neither does anybody else. So uh, staying in the market is the most important thing long term. So you want to talk to a professional about your age. You want to, if you have a 401k, you want to invest the maximum amount you can, because usually there's a match from the from the company. And these are basic things. And believe it or not, it's the basics that matter. It's the basics that people don't do. They don't put away money regularly. They don't maximize their 401k if they have one available. They're too uh, cautious on their risk. 30-year-olds can easily afford to put almost all their money in, in the stock market of their retirement savings and not worry about should they put you know 20% in the bond market. It's, you're too young to worry about that. Um, I, as far as real estate goes, I was the real estate correspondent for many years in the early 1990s. Uh, the people I talk to and I, my personal belief is if you're going to be in a home for a number of years, and I mean more than five years, owning a home makes economic sense. Shorter than that, I don't think it does particularly. There are things you have to consider when you own a home. There is ownership costs associated with it. Uh, not just the price. So there is, a, it's not, you know, free money, but over time, particularly if you stay in a house a long time, the, the economic advantages of home ownership are very obvious. 
Um, I've been in my home for decades and um, I've owned it for more than 15 years. Uh, so um, I can tell you that it's very nice not to have any payments on a monthly basis uh, for something. So I'm a big believer in largely owning stocks, small amount of bonds, small amount of cash. And if you're living, if you're staying in one place for a while, definitely owning your home. That's, those are my opinions though, I think, but most professionals, I think would make those kinds of uh, comments uh, as well. Yeah, that's definitely helpful, Bob. So thank you. Um, and then last up, the New York Stock Exchange celebrated 231 years this week. Um, so, you know, you've been there for a while working there. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the Stock Exchange? Yeah, I got there in 1997. Uh, I, had been, I had done stuff sporadically from 93 to 97, but I came full time in 97. There were 4,000 people on the floor when I got there in 1997. Um, and 80% of the volume in all NYSC trading happened on the floor, open outcry guys yelling at each other. Today, there is 225, 250 guys doing uh, 15 to 20% of the volume. That's technological disruption. That's what happens when you change the payment structure uh, and when you go to electronic trading and you go in sub-second intervals, you have computers and software that enables sub-second trading. For a lot of people, that's a better way to trade. It's more efficient, it's faster, and that's technological disruption. So I saw the NYSE at its very height in the mid 1990s, uh, and uh, it celebrated the floor. Uh, and the NYSE is still going strong. It's now owned by ICE. Uh, it owns ICE owns a number of different businesses, including futures businesses, uh, data business. It owns um, uh, mortgage technology businesses. Um, and this week they celebrated. It was their 231st, as I recall, uh, May 17, 1792. Um, uh, under down the street on Wall Street, Wall Street and William Street, um, there was a, a coffee house down the road, and there was this is a bit of a, a, le a legend uh, a buttonwood tree. A, a buttonwood tree is a sycamore, as I recall. It's they're called a buttonwood tree because the wood is very hard, and they were used to make button uh, buttons. So it's called a buttonwood tree. Um, and there were twenty four traders. Uh, and they got together and they signed an agreement amongst themselves. It was really a monopoly agreement. The agreement said, um, we will only trade amongst us 24 and we will charge a fixed commission. As I recall, it was a quarter percent. Um, and so these guys signed the document. It became known as the Buttonwood Agreement. It's still at the NYSC. They have the original copy. If you're ever lucky enough to go on to the, the, the floor where the luncheon club used to be on the sixth floor, They're, the original copy is there. It's one of the most important documents in American history. Um, and uh, these 24 members all signed it. You can still see it. Um, and there's a number of interesting signatures on it. The, one of the guys who signed it was named Leonard Bleeker. And Bleeker was a, uh, a merchant. Um, he, he did in trading, import-export business. Um, and these guys, he also had wanted to be a broker. There wasn't many stocks to trade in 1792. What had happened was Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, was the Secretary of the Treasury, and they had made the decision under Hamilton, um, and Hamilton pushed this for the new government, this was the new United States, brand new, to take on the debts of the old Continental Congress. And they had issued bonds to Continental Congress, and most people thought they were going to repudiate them when the new government came in, the new country was formed, but they didn't. Hamilton said, and Washington went along with this, that it would improve confidence if we assumed the debt of the Continental Congress in the new government of the United States of America. And they did. And so there was a lot of bonds to trade, not many stocks, but a lot of bonds. And so what these guys did, these 24 people did, was they were largely bond traders. They got together. So there was this guy, um, Leonard Bleeker. And Bleeker, a couple of years later, was approached by people to do a real estate deal in way uptown. Uh, you have to understand New York City ended uh, what we would now call Canal Street, right up the street from the New York Stock Exchange, about a quarter mile. New York was essentially a tiny part of downtown Manhattan, what is today Manhattan, tiny little piece of downtown. We call it Wall Street or the financial district today. Uh, but at that time, past that uh, was uh, essentially Indian territory, um, and Wall Street actually did have a wall in front of it uh, up until, oh, you know, the, the, the 1690s um, to keep out Indians and to keep out 
the British, uh, this was a Dutch city, it was called New Amsterdam, and the British eventually took over the city, of course. So this fellow Bleeker um, was approached and said, we, we want to build, by real estate development, we want to build a new little settlement in the middle of the island. And everybody thought this was crazy, like this is way up, way, way, there was no, there was nothing there. And he decided to go ahead and do it. And they called the, the, the neighborhood Greenwich Village. And of course, Greenwich was a town in England. These are all uh, people descended from England. And uh, it became very successful. And if you go to Greenwich Village today, you can still walk down Bleecker Street. It, it was named after Leonard Bleecker. His middle name, I believe, was Lispinard. And there's also a street named Lispinard Street. And one of the reasons, the odd things about going to Greenwich Village is many of the streets don't go at right angles. They don't, they're not rectilinear. They wander around because the, the plan, there wasn't a clear plan. So the streets were laid out at irregular patterns at that time. And it wasn't until about 1811 that New York had a grid plan just above uh, where downtown, uh, where, uh, the heart of Greenwich Village is right now. So um, it, it's next time you go to Greenwich Village and if you go walk down Bleecker Street and there's Leonard Bleecker's name and he's one of the guys who signed the declaration uh, the, the Buttonwood Agreement uh, that started the New York Stock Exchange. By the way, um, apropos of nothing, there was no continuous trading at the New York Stock Exchange. People ask me about this all the time. We didn't have continuous trading until the 1860s. Uh, before that, stocks traded essentially by appointment. And, and by that, I mean uh, one stock at a time happened. So you had the chairman of the NYSE. He stood on a podium. And there were members that were called seat holders. They actually had a seat and they sat in a semicircle around him. And he would he would say, OK, uh, we're going to trade Union Pacific. I don't, I don't know if Union Pacific traded part of that, but there was a lot of railroads that traded um, uh, during the 18, you know, 40s and 50s. That was the big thing. That was the Internet of its stage. So we'll say, uh, you know, XYZ Railroad will trade. And they would trade it for five minutes. So the chairman would say, I have a bid, $10, let's begin. And they would trade just that one stock for five minutes. And then they would go on to another stock. They didn't start continuous trading where they traded all, all the stocks all throughout the day until the 1860s, believe it or not. There is, if you're ever lucky enough to get the NYC on the seventh floor, a remnant of the old building. The, the building that's there now is the 1903 building. But there was a building next door that was built uh, in the 1860s, just as continuous trading was coming in. And there is a clock there on the wall on the seventh floor. It's the only thing from the original building. Uh, and the clock only tells time in five minute intervals. And the reason it does that is because that's how they did it. They, 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 it's literally a five minute handle. And uh, at the end of five minutes, they they stop. So uh, it was. It, it's a wonderful little remnant. I always point out it's in the boardroom. Uh, where people come in for their IPOs and they come in for big important meetings. If you're a, uh, if you're a listed company, you have the right to use the upstairs for um, board meetings, for example. So I always point out that clock on the on the wall. Nobody pays much attention to it. So the NYC is full of all sorts of interesting little pieces of history, Katie. And some other time, I'll give you little pieces of it uh, for uh, for your consumption. Uh, it's I always I call the place the Phantom of the Opera Tour because there's a lot of little nooks and uh, crannies that you can get lost in walking around, uh, particularly even on the stairways. So we'll talk about some other uh, interesting tidbits about the NYSE some other time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the history of it is just fascinating and it's very cool. I think that you get to be a part of history, you know, to this day, every day when you go in to work. I feel that very much walking in there, believe me. And you, if you think it doesn't matter anymore, you should see all the tourists taking pictures of you as you're walking in the building. They just stand outside and just stare at the building. It's really impressive still. Yeah, for sure. And so, Bob, I'm going to throw in one more question before we end today. Um, we had one coming from Frank Holland, our worldwide exchange anchor. Um, and his question is, do you see a volatile or down week for stocks ahead of June 1st? You know, we've talked about what's been moving the market. So, Well, again, this is going to be totally headline driven. Um, we've gone through most of the earnings season have a sense the last people to report are retailers but the, the big ones the walmart's targets uh, home depot have already reported so again you, you saw what happened today. we literally dropped 25 points on word that there's a stall in negotiations if the negotiations pick up uh, on sunday for example i would anticipate the market to rally a little bit the, the issue after that let's assume that that happens the issue after that 
is what side of the recession debate are you on? Is, is, is the evidence that inflation is continuing to move down at a pace that's satisfactory to the Federal Reserve, or are they going to feel they have to continue to hike interest rates? Right now, the bet is they will not do anything at the June meeting, it, it's, but there are some people who think they will. Some people think they'll pause and then write hike again in the meeting after that. Again, we're, it's what side of the debate on the recession you're on and how successful is getting inflation down. If you think that inflation is going to remain high uh, and that the Fed is going to have to hike several more times during the year and forget about lowering rates later in the year, uh, the market is probably too high priced and it's probably going to have to come down. Um, how much? Well, that depends. So you have this dynamic of inflation's too high, we keep raising rates. Markets afraid of a recession, you know, to the extent they have to keep raising rates, that increases the chances of a recession. So again, what side of the recession inflation debate are you on? There are people who say it's not coming down fast enough, markets too expensive. Uh, earnings in the second half of the year are too high. They may be right. We just we just don't know. For right now, though, job growth still strong, earnings some slippage, but nothing nothing uh, dramatic. Thanks, Bob. It's hard to believe that we're already talking about June, but we are definitely getting. We're in the second June. half of the year, believe mm -hmm. it or not. And remember, the stock market's a forward-looking mechanism. It's a discount mechanism for trying to figure out a future stream of cash flow, of earnings, uh, of dividends, and it tends to look six to 12 months out. So we're already you know, looking in the second half of the year. The, the retailers, the, those Walmart people, they're already well into order. They, they have their orders in for back to school, and they're now looking at their orders for Christmas now. So they have a, they're a future looking, forward looking group too. So we're, there are, depending on how you look at it, there are people trying to figure out what earnings are going to look like in the first and second quarter now of 2024. Um, and again, generally, uh, analysts tend to be optimistic a year out, um, but and the numbers are higher. The estimates are higher for the first and second quarter. So we'll see. Just remember, where do you stand on that inflation and recession today? All right. Well, we will definitely be checking in with you many more times throughout the year. Um, we will see you again in June. Thank you, Bob, for answering all of your questions. And thank you to everyone for sending in your questions. Thank you, guys. Great questions as always. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Bob. Talk soon.